Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and I'm pleased to be examining episode seven of Masters of the Air in this latest installment of Real History. I think one of the interesting things about this latest episode is that its debut on Apple TV Plus actually coincides 80 years to the week of the events depicted in this episode. So I think that's something very unique to keep in mind as we watch. We left off last time with this tearful yet joyful reunion of Buck and Bucky at Stalag Wolf 3, and I'm very interested to see how that prisoner of war lifestyle is going to be further depicted in this episode. So let's go ahead and take a look at episode seven of Masters of the Air. Stalag Wolf 3 was run by the German Air Force, and because we had their downed pilots in our camps, they treated our boys humanely enough. By this point in the war, Clevin and Egan have been imprisoned at Stalag Luft 3 for nearly half a year. And one can only imagine how stir crazy they were going. Uh, there's a really good account of life at Stalag Luft 3 in this book entitled The Mighty Eighth at War, a phenomenal coffee table book with all sorts of photos and anecdotes. And I'd like to share a story with you from a B-17 crewman by the name of First Lieutenant John McGrath, who I think very succinctly sums up what life was like here at Stalag at Luft 3 near Sagan. And he arrived shortly after what we see here um, that spring in 1944. Our new home was the West Compound, open April 27, 1944. It would eventually house nearly 2,500 men. There were four other compounds, north, south, east, and west. The camp would eventually hold about 10,000 men. West camp consisted of 17 blocks, a cookhouse, theater, show building, laundry building, and fire pole. All the blocks had shallow spaces running uh, under the length of the building. They were used by the guards, known as ferrets, to check for any tunnel building activity. Each guard had a steel prod, like a screwdriver they used to investigate anything that looked suspicious under the block floor. The building was poorly constructed, especially the roof, which frequently leaked. Each building had a central hallway with rooms on either side. There was also a washroom and a small latrine at the end of the building. The latrine could be used at night. There was a large latrine building in the compound to be used during the day. Every night the block doors were barricaded with a wooden bar. No one was permitted out of the block after 10 p.m. When the blocks were secured, German shepherd dogs were let loose in the compound to discourage anyone from going outside. Searchlights from the guard towers swept back and forth across the compound. Lights out came at midnight. Our room had triple bunks, enough for 15 men. Each bunk was allowed nine slats. Guards made inspections to check on the number of slats. In their minds, any discrepancy meant a tunnel was being built. We were the first ones in our room, and I picked a middle bunk. The mattress was a burlap-like cover and filled with straw or wood shavings. It was not very comfortable. The bunk became very personal to me. It was my little space in a hostile world. I spent a lot of time in my bunk, sleeping, reading, or just hanging out. Now the hold up. War. Red Cross is having trouble getting mail into the camp. I have here a recreation of a Red Cross parcel. Um, and th these were mass produced like you couldn't believe. And uh, the typical Red Cross parcel, and we even get a glimpse of them uh, in the background of some of these scenes, they usually included the likes of uh, sugar cubes, cheese, peanut butter, jam, crackers, cereal, chocolate, margarine, spam, raisins, and usually five to seven packs of cigarettes, which were very useful to trade with the guards. The American Red Cross <laughs> packed more than 600,000 of these per month uh, during the war. And uh, meanwhile, things like uh, record players and even film projectors were often sent by the YMCA back in the States. And so there were some creature comforts that were made available to these prisoners. 
Oh, and I'm fairly certain Hambone wasn't its Stalwart Wolf 3 with Clevin. I could be wrong on that. If you have a definitive answer, let me know in the comments section below. Something else that would be sent to prisoners while they were overseas would be the likes of a wartime logbook. And these could be used for letter writing, for creating art. Something else really interesting from my collection um, is I have here an original Red Cross sweater. And so these were likewise knit and produced in mass quantities back in the States. And uh, you can even see the original Red Cross label uh, there tucked inside. So these would have been exactly the sorts of things that prisoners would have been wearing. And hat tip to costume designer Colleen Atwood, uh, because we can also see our prisoners uh, wearing some British uniforms uh, here and there. Um, access to Britain, obviously it's, it's a little bit closer. And there are a lot of Brits who are likewise in Stalag Wolf 3. And so there was this exchange of clothing from time to time as well. Brits try to not attack. I'm on a casino. Didn't go well. And uh, the crowd sent nine or ten divisions to hands you. So this episode overlaps chronologically with the third battle of Monte Cassino, which commenced March 15th, 1944. And in that phase of the fighting, it wasn't merely uh, British troops, um, as they're hearing over the radio, uh, but New Zealanders and Gurkhas played a very big role in that battle as well. I had the chance to visit both Monte Cassino and Anzio uh, fairly recently, and like any battlefield, one gains a whole new appreciation when you have the chance to visit it in person. But the fights were as vicious and costly as Clevin suggests here. And I can't say with any certainty whether or not Clevin tinkered with a contraband radio. However, I, I do know that some British prisoners elsewhere in the compound made such a contraption and they actually hid it in first an accordion and then a model sailboat, which they actually took sailing in some body of water in the camp. In other camps, some crafty GIs made crystal radios with the like of bake like soap dishes, um, crystals that were embedded in thimbles, um, spare rayon wire cord, uh, stolen German earphones. Um, these guys were desperate for information and they were incredibly innovative too. <laughs> but the mathematically minded Clevin also put his skills to use at Stalaglyph 3 by teaching and presenting prisoners with calculus lessons, um, all things. Uh, and so something, something that isn't as cinematically exciting, perhaps, as making a radio from scratch under German noses. No offense to calculus fans out there. I'm a humanities guy myself. You thought Sergeants Quinn and Bailey were among the many casualties over Regensburg, but thanks to the French and Belgian resistance, they were back at Thorpe Abbott's. Allow me to offer some additional background on the experiences and escapes of William Quinn and Kenneth Bailey, who, as a quick reminder, went missing in action on August 17th, 1943, during the Regensburg mission. It's, it's a rather incredible story. Um, the following appeared in the November 18th, 1943 issue of the Wynwood Gazette. And uh, that was the periodical from Bailey's Oklahoma hometown newspaper. Uh, so this is what it had to say. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Bailey have word from the War Department at Washington, D.C., asking to have appropriate ceremonies at Will Rogers Field and be awarded the Medal of Oakley for outstanding service during aeronautical combat duty for their son, Kenneth Bailey, who was reported missing in action since August 18th. Mr. and Mrs. Bailey preferred to have the medal sent here rather than public service at Rogers Field, believing and hoping their son is alive somewhere and will be located at some future time. So this is several months later, and they still don't know whether their son is alive or dead. He was missing in August. Here we are in November, and you can only imagine that gnawing uncertainty that 
plague their everyday lives. Uh, so just really difficult stuff to bear. But what happened next? Uh, additional details can be found in Quinn's Questionnaire for Service Personnel Evading Enemy Occupied Countries. <laughs> I almost forgot the full title of it there. Um, and so that was recorded following his return to the United Kingdom. And his records indicate that in August 1943 that he landed near Diepenbeek, Belgium. And he was asked some of the following questions upon his return. And this was fairly customary for POWs who were able to make it back. What was your position in the aircraft? First radio operator. Were you wounded? No. Did you pay your guides? If so, how much? And he uh, noted 2,000 francs. Did you speak French or Spanish? No. Did you have your identity papers? Yes. And this is where it gets interesting. A date of arrival in Spain, December 23rd, 1943. So, He's living several months on the run here. Date of arrival in Gibraltar, February 3rd, 1944, another two months after that. Place and date of departure for UK, February 4th, 1944. So he was not in Gibraltar long. Perhaps he was able to link up with British troops there or the like. And finally, place and date of arrival in UK, Prestwick. February 6th, 1944. So that is a rather incredible half year journey of escape and evasion. Um, and presumably he makes it back to Thorpe Abbott's in February uh, 1944, uh, right before this episode is set. Incredible. There we go. Sounds about right. Berlin or its environs. You hear that? <laughs> it's Berlin. <laughs> so the Army Air Forces conducted its first vast mission over Berlin on March 6, 1944. And as we think of scope beyond the 100th bomb group, uh, like nearly 700 heavy bombers pummeled the city uh, that day. And even more shockingly for the Americans, uh, one out of every 10 of them failed to return. So this shocking rate of attrition still persists. Christ. It's 15 down. Mm. Lieutenant Jack Longnecker of the 100th had these thoughts on yet another devastating mission into Germany. And this was told to the United Press and was published for March 7th. And this is what Longnecker has to say. There were 16 men in my barracks yesterday morning. Only eight of us went to bed last night. Some of those who didn't come back crashed in flaming planes in the streets of Berlin. The German fighters came in waves of six straight toward us with wings lit up with blazing guns like Broadway. Then they split up into teams of three swept under our planes and zoomed up into a group behind us. The first groups knocked down two fortresses. One exploded. Then six more fighters came the same way. Every nose gun in our squadron blasted away at them. The whole thing turned into a wild scramble. There would be a big flash of flame and a plane would disappear with only a small ball of smoke still hanging in the sky. We were flying in close formation, but time and time again, I saw the German fighters go through narrow lanes between our bombers. Out in front of us, there was a tremendous dogfight with hundreds of fighters milling around. The sky seemed full of burning pieces and wisps of smoke. Our Mustangs and Lightnings were doing a hell of a job. So certainly, I think it's safe to say in these scenes, there's very little exaggeration uh, because it may seem like some of these scenes could be overdone with all these swirling dogfights and hundreds of planes. But genuinely, as Lieutenant Longnecker 
attest to here. Um, this was the nature of the game. Let's get a crew on it. Wow, this, this B-17 looks like a piece of Swiss cheese, and I'm, I'm continually amazed when I look at wartime photographs of shot-up ships like this, and they somehow were able to sputter their way back to base. It, it takes incredible skill to land a plane that is so badly shot up, but the photos don't lie to us. Um, they speak not only to the dependability of the aviators at the wheels, but also of the ships themselves. And on this point of greeting these damaged planes back to base, uh, we're once again uh, compelled to think about the words of Ken Lemons, uh, one of the ground crew. And he notes of this mission, March 6, 1944 was a dark and bloody day for the 100th. The 8th Air Force dispatched 730 bombers with an escort of 800 fighters to Berlin. The column stretched for 60 miles. 36 planes took off from our base. During the course of the mission, 15 bombers, nearly half of the 100th bomb group, would be lost. Those aircraft returning had plenty of battle damage. The crew chiefs took stock of what we had to get done and set out to put the crippled ships back together. There was no time for the ground crews to stop for morning. Another maximum effort might be called for the next day. While we would work through the night, the air crews had nothing to keep them occupied. They would try to sleep tonight with 150 bunks mocking them. One after another. They killed them all. Every last one of them. Pilots on both sides occasionally did target descending parachutists, but this didn't seem to happen with great frequency because there was to an extent this, this common understanding, a code of chivalry that was maintained among opposing aviators and targeting a bailing airman just wasn't generally done because they realized that they themselves could be in that position someday. But that said, uh, tempers could flare and get the best of some pilots. Uh, it's an interesting side point, something that comes to mind. Um, one pilot who is shot down in France the day prior to this mission eventually escapes to Spain, just like Quinn and Bailey did. That pilot's name was Chuck Yeager, and of course he'll famously break the sound barrier just three years later. We all needed to distract ourselves from the war. I decided to call Sandra. I told myself all I wanted was someone to drink and laugh with, but then I called her a second time. <laughs> and a third. Crosby believed he became something of a celebrity merely because he was a member of the 100th Bomb Group. Uh, he was being interviewed by famous correspondents, he was recorded on the BBC, and he started feeling quite confident uh, about himself. He definitely had a, a chip on his shoulder to an extent. And this, in part, further spurred his romantic rendezvous with Landra. And on this pattern, uh, he notes, in the language of the time, I was hot stuff. In London, this all paid out in attention. For the first time in my life, I got advances from unescorted women. When they learned that I was a survivor of the notorious 100th bomb group, they thought that it was their duty to be especially nice to me. Never before in my life had I been a target for good-looking women. I had Jean at home and Landra in England. I started seeing Landra every time I could. This guy's kind of playing with fire here. Okay, uh, Murphy. Finally. Murphy. Oh. Hamilton. Thanks. And Clement. Thank you. See, fellas. Maybe next time. Mail call! It's from my mom. I suppose now is a good time to reintroduce the character of Frank Murphy, who uh, later authored the very detailed memoir, uh, A Luck of the Draw, which I've been referencing from time to time as we've been analyzing Masters of the Air. 
shortly after he was captured, he wrote the following to his mom, Mary, who is referenced in this scene. And this is from October 28th, 1943, his first letter home. Dear Mom, I hope you know before this letter arrives that I'm a prisoner of war. We had a little bad luck and had to bail out of our ship. I was slightly wounded, but I am okay. If you can arrange it, I would like to have a package sent to me. I need socks, underwear, and handkerchiefs. Also, chocolate if it is available. The Red Cross will give you all the information as to how to send the package. Please write my commanding officer and tell him I am a prisoner. I am in reasonably good health, so please don't worry about me. Tell everyone hello for me and that I will see you all again someday. And give my love to dad and the family, Frank. One of the great things to point out about this scene is that um, Murphy does in fact receive a letter from his mom around this time in March of 1944. And in fact, it was the first time hearing from her since his captivity began five months earlier. So he goes nearly half a year without hearing from any of his family members. Last letter I sent before Bremen, I popped a question. You did? She said yes. So a good question to ponder as we think about the home front, what is Marge doing during the war? Uh, at the outset of the conflict, as we mentioned in a previous episode, she was enrolled at the Texas Technological College. And it seems that she was a rather musical person who played the piano, um, going from some of the newspaper accounts of the time. And other newspapers of the era indicate that she was very involved in the civic affairs and related activities to assist in the war effort on the home front. So that's a good gal that Clevin has found. Also, a continuity question that I have, why is it winter in Germany and everything's very lush and green um, in England? I don't think that's how weather in England works out. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's very difficult with all these wheels in motion um, and a miniseries is such to get everything to line up perfectly seasonally in that regard, perhaps. Now, for those of you unaware, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Bennett, the new CEO of the 349th Squadron. Due to Colonel Hardin's trip to London this morning, I've been placed in temporary command of the entire 100th Bomb Group. Lieutenant Colonel John M. Bennett Jr. held from a very well-to-do banking family in Texas, and he tended to have a rather unnerving <laughs> influence on the men. He was tall, he was stern, he was focused. And here's what Crosby has to say about him. On one mission, when he was filling in as a pilot of a wing plane, his plane got hit over the rally point and the electrical system cut out. That night, his co-pilot had much to say. That bastard isn't human. He's a machine. There we were, dropping 700 feet a minute, and I wanted to hit the bell. Then I realized with our power out, the bell wouldn't ring. All the while, that son of a bitch was sitting there fiddling with the standby electrical system, showing about as much excitement as if he was cleaning his fingernails. Then the dials flip into position and we've got power. We're dropping about 500 feet per, but one by one he pops the engines and we've got a bird again. He slacks back and says to me, smiling like, now let's get back in formation, Lieutenant, he says. <laughs> so uh, this character of Bennett, he's the guy who had the capacity to keep his cool. Although Bennett's time as unit CO was to be short-lived, Crosby later credited him for helping to whip the group into shape following some rather staggering missions. The target for today is Berlin, specifically the Erkner Ball Bearing Plant. The significance of the Erkner Ball Bearing Plant was underscored in a 1947 report entitled U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey. And this is a post-war assessment. This is what it had to say. The Berlin Erkner factory produced medium and large sizes of ball and roller bearings using balls obtained from the Schweinfurt plant. Total employment was 1,826 workers and the value of the output represented 7% of the whole German anti-friction bearing industry. So that 
very much underscores the importance of this target. Our chances of defeating the Luftwaffe were increased by the introduction of the P-51 Mustang. My friend and co-author of Into the Cold, Blue veteran John Homan, said that whenever he met a P-51 pilot in a pub, he'd buy him a drink, maybe even a whole bottle. Um, B-17 airmen adored the guys who flew the Mustangs, and for good reason. Holy cow, that is a lot of planes. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, um, I don't feel this is an exaggeration uh, at all. And this is what, what my buddy John Homan has to say about this rapid style of dogfighting. He said, Germans tried shaking off the Mustangs with impressive acrobatics, but the Americans were too fast. Planes swooped in and out of sight in the blink of an eye. Imagine a typical race car circling the Indianapolis 500, then double or triple its speed. That's how fast this rate of action was. Aircraft 1,500 yards out zipped over our ships in a heartbeat. The experience was surreal. Buzzing the tower was illegal on most bases due to obvious safety concerns, and most commanding officers would fine pilots or crews who conducted uh, such shenanigans. Um, at the Halesworth Air Base, for instance, um, pilots were fined upward of $500 for buzzing the tower or the field. And when one crew was on the eve of completing their final mission, though, they took a collection in advance to pay for the fine that they were all too happy to accept. Brass is upping the end of tour requirements from 25 to 30 missions. Are you serious? What? Well, congratulations, Rosie. I mean, changing the rules on us mid-game? That's bullshit, Jack. So John Herman felt a degree of similar vulnerability it just later that summer uh, when his mission quota was likewise raised and this is what he notes of that he indicates in earlier phases of eighth air force campaigns the prospect of surviving 25 missions was only 30 percent those odds improved to 50 percent with the arrival of more consistent fighter support none of us should have been surprised when the minimum requirement was eventually altered to 35 missions when Eisenhower was appointed Supreme Allied Commander, I sensed he didn't want to ship any of us flyboys back prematurely, lest the Normandy invasion fall flat on its ass. He needed the planes, he needed the crews. Therefore, the mission count was again raised. We felt ever more expendable. You know, during these last few weeks, I have missed you terribly. The song playing in the background is prisoner of love, appropriately enough. Um, perhaps that's how Crosby himself feels on, uh, on this point. Uh, but on another point, uh, where does Wingate, named Westgate in the series, she is described as Wingate by Crosby in the book, where does she work? What does she do? What is her mystery? Um, Crosby has his suspicions, as he later outlines in his book. He said, I never really knew what she did. I never saw another unit patch like the one she wore on her shoulders. She told me her office was on Sloan Square, but once when I went there to surprise her, I found no military office at the address. When on trunks, which was what the British called their long distance phone lines, I tried to phone her at the number she gave me. I felt my call was forwarded through three or four exchanges. At each exchange, I got a guarded voice. May I ask who's calling, please? Or may I ask the purpose of your call, please? The voice might say, Subaltern Wingate is not available, sir. Is she out for lunch or she, will she be gone for a long time? And the voice would respond, I'm not at liberty to say, sir. Most women in the British services were promoted slowly. I think Landra skipped a rank because she soon became a captain. 
I will request that Captain Wingate answer your call, but it may be a while, was often the response. So uh, there is perhaps some covert stuff going on here. I'm not going to spill the beans yet, but perhaps uh, some of Crosby's suspicions are true. Brits in North Compound built three tunnels. Jesus Christ, how? Yeah. I've been digging them for over a year. Nothing like this has ever happened. Colonel believes there'll be severe reprisals as more senior officers in the SS and Gestapo become aware of the magnitude of the escape. Contrary to the immensely entertaining 1963 movie, The Great Escape, uh, the real life escape of March 24th, 25th, 1944, was an entirely British and Commonwealth affair. Um, unfortunately, there was no Steve McQueen jumping barbed wire fences on his motorcycle. God, that's such a cool scene though. Um, there were several compounds within the larger camp and the various nationalities therein were essentially segregated to an extent. Um, my late friend, Jerry Conlon, who I mentioned in the previous episode, arrived at Stalag Luft III shortly after the Great Escape, and uh, it was this recent attempt was naturally the talk of the camp, um, and so worry over reprisals were definitely on the prisoners' minds at this moment. You're only gonna know this me, not the old me. Me before I got here. So if we can get out, we we'll get out. Right before this episode came out, the 100th Bomb Group Foundation released a pretty much never before seen photo of Egan, a picture of him taken in captivity. And my goodness, uh, the war and his incarceration, it looks like it aged him several years. I mean, the guy is in tatters. This idea of him recognizing that he's an old person, that that sort of zeal or energy that he once had is gone. Uh, I think it's a very real sentiment being expressed. There are orders for me to take an inventory of all Jewish prisoners of war at Stalag Luft III. There are only Americans in Stalag Luft III, Major Simulite. Only Americans. Yeah, buddy, you tell them. <laughs> this conversation, though, it reminds me of another story that John Homan and I were able to uncover for our book, Into the Cold Blue. And it's, uh, it's a very telling one. And we note, captivity was most dangerous of all for flyboys of the Jewish faith. Ira Weinstein, a member of John's bomb group, was shot down later in 1944 and survived two weeks on the run, attempting to reach neutral Switzerland before he was ultimately seized. The lieutenant was hurled into a holding cell with a dozen other Americans, including two badly wounded airmen. Weinstein requested an audience with the commandant and demanded proper medical treatment for the ailing captives. And a well-dressed German major approached him at that moment and declared, You Jews and Americans are bombing our churches, our schools, our hospitals. I'll show you what I think of the Geneva Convention. The commandant then smashed a riding crop across Weinstein's face splitting his lip and knocking him to the floor. The lieutenant survived this initial beating, but was bound for equally daunting trials. He was relocated to a camp later toured by Heinrich Himmler, the brutal leader of the Gestapo and Waffen-SS. Himmler came to the camp and left word that all Jews and officers were to be separated and shot, the captive recalled. Weinstein's brave American superior intervened, warning the Germans you march one Jewish guy off this camp and we'll riot. The Nazis never carried out their threats. Weinstein and his fellow prisoners were liberated May 11th, 1945. Another nice touch of material culture that we see here is that we can see a tag, much like this one, on the officer's chest. And this was essentially the identification tag. And this one that I am holding is representative of something that would have been worn at Stalag Luft 7. Um, another um, almost equally infamous camp is Stalag Luft 3. So the great material details in this series just abound. And it's, it's the little stuff like this that can uh, help create that sense of authenticity. 
How could I sleep at night knowing I get to go home while the brass up their numbers mid-tour? I can't imagine some rookie coming to take my place, getting himself and his crew killed on their first mission, and then he gets replaced by another replacement and over and over and over again. This will be among many incredible feats and acts of selflessness on Rosie's part before the war is done. Uh, buckle in, folks. It's going to be one hell of a ride for this guy over the next few episodes. The invasion will not, cannot occur to the Luftwaffe is destroyed. And we have complete and total air superiority. This conversation reminds me of some of my research that I conducted for my first World War II book. Um, that's uh, Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion. And it's, it's this big question of when and where and how and through what means will this momentous invasion of Western Europe finally take place? And I think we need to reframe the conversation a little bit about when the invasion of Europe begins in earnest. And uh, this is at least what some generals of the Air Force has had to say. Um, and I note of this sort of dynamic, over the flak-filled skies of Hamburg and Schweinfurt, the invasion of Europe was already on. As the result of relentless Allied bombing, once illustrious centers of German industry and culture increasingly resembled glowing heaps of red ash. In March 1944, Army Air Force's Chief Henry Hap Arnold presented the point to inquiring reporters. We are invading, and not at some remote beachhead. We are hitting the enemy where he lives. He knows if he cannot stop us, he's licked. The increased tempo of aerial assaults was no sideshow of an impending amphibious operation. An architect of strategic bombing, the silver-haired Arnold took flying lessons from the Wright brothers and once soared as a movie stunt pilot. Now, he facilitated some of the most destructive fury ever witnessed in war. This plan is simply to destroy Germany's ability to make war, he asserted. The missions we send out are not to be confused with what used to be called air raids. A great mission of today is a planned battle. I think this episode does a very fitting job of presenting the sort of waiting games that Allied service members in England were enduring in this build up to the Normandy invasion. Uh, I mean, it's one service member, one reporter said that England in this point of the war, it was like just one big mechanical Niagara. It's, it's just this overflowing gush of men and equipment and supplies and everything else. Uh, many of these airmen, of course, had been here in England for close to two years by this point, but they've noticed that this island nation is starting to become more and more crowded as that big push-off across the channel is about to commence. So a very appropriate cliffhanger here that we conclude with. Thank you once again for joining us on Real History. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to hit that subscribe button below. We also invite you to check out the website of the 100th Bomb Group Foundation, which has been able to provide so much of this wonderful material as far as research items is concerned. And as always, we appreciate you tuning in. And until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious.